Mainland banks recruit debt collection talents accused of hiring enforcers. China expert explains why the CCP leader refuses to rescue the economy. Protests, wage strikes, and leaflet distribution rampant on the eve of June 4 across the mainland. Collisions with trains in Heilongjiang and Hunan result in seven deaths and three injuries. Asia's tallest waterfall faked? Water pipes discovered at the source on Yuntaishan. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Mainland banks recruit debt collection talents accused of hiring enforcers. On June 4, the topic several banks begin recruiting debt collection talents appeared on the hot search list of mainland social platforms. Deep Blue Finance reports that the privately owned Sanxiang Bank plans to recruit debt collection talents. On May 31, Sanxiang Bank announced that due to business development needs, it is now recruiting nationwide for positions such as senior debt collection management talents and senior telephone collection talents, totaling seven positions. The job requirements are a bachelor's degree or higher, with a background in law or finance, and at least five years of experience in debt collection management. Besides this bank, in the past half-month, other financial institutions such as Everbright Bank and WeBank have also been planning to recruit personnel related to debt collection. Netizens have expressed various opinions on this matter. Do you now need a bachelor's degree to recruit an enforcer? Society is too competitive. Just a few words could drive someone to ruin, the bank makes money, you do the dirty work, do less of this kind of morally damaging work. This is blatantly creating social unrest. Recently, frequent distressing incidents have been reported at the Nanjong Huan Bridge in Taiyuan, Shangxi. Netizens have noted that there have been more than 10 such events over the past 10 days. In response, authorities have closed off the bridge and installed safety nets. People expressed that these acts of desperation are often driven by economic hardships such as unemployment and difficulties in managing mortgage payments. The problem of bad debts in mainland Chinese banks. Data from the China Banking Regulatory Commission on May 31 shows that as of the end of the first quarter, the non-performing loan rate of commercial banks was 1.59%, roughly the same as last quarter. The balance of non-performing loans increased by 141.4 billion yuan to 3.4 trillion yuan, approximately $470 billion. Official data shows that in 2023, the unpaid non-performing loans of Chinese commercial banks climbed to a record high of 3.23 trillion yuan, approximately $450 billion. China expert explains why the CCP leader refuses to rescue the economy. After conducting field research in China in the spring of 2024, Scott Kennedy, director of the China Business and Political Economy Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, SIZE, found that the Chinese people commonly express concern about their country and its future. He wrote in Foreign Policy, people repeatedly ask the same question, why hasn't the CCP leadership taken more measures to boost the economy and restore confidence? What they really mean by leadership is the party leader Xi Jinping himself. Despite a lackluster economic performance heavily reliant on exports and significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Chinese economy showed no substantial signs of improvement in 2024. Analysts even speculate that the growth rate might be as low as 1-2%. to Regarding why the CCP has not taken stronger measures to save the economy, Kennedy summarizes four commonly held views, which can be summarized as the CCP's political style of four no's. The first view, party leaders do not know the real situation. Kennedy posits that Xi Jinping is uninformed about China's economic issues because his subordinates filter out negative information to avoid backlash. Sources indicate that grassroots officials provide only positive data to external researchers, and senior officials curate Xi's information to reflect security and propaganda agendas. However, many dispute this view arguing that she and other leaders are well-informed through diverse information channels. The second view, the party leader does not understand governance. Kennedy argues that Xi Jinping does not effectively understand how to manage the economy. He is overwhelmed by numerous complex issues, including a real estate crisis, escalating local debts, low birth rates, 
growing inequality, unrest in Hong Kong, and rising international tensions. These challenges hinder effective solution development. Despite receiving information, lengthy debates among leadership often delay decision-making and policy implementation, exemplified by the delayed response to a weak stock market until early 2024. The CCP's third plenum was also postponed due to lack of consensus. The current CCP leadership, described as a B-team, lacks extensive central government experience, complicating policymaking and interagency coordination. Third view, the party leader simply does not care. Xi Jinping prioritizes ideological concerns over economic management, focusing more on consolidating CCP power and his political dominance. His attention is mainly on security and political issues, not economic leadership. Critics argue that she sacrifices economic stability for nationalism and CCP control. For instance, a recent 300 billion yuan housing policy aimed at supporting state-owned enterprises was criticized as too little and too late, and seen as ineffective by many, including a Western-educated economist who suggested direct financial support to citizens would be more effective. Despite calls for direct market interventions to aid real estate and boost consumer confidence, she has resisted these measures, preferring austerity, according to the Wall Street Journal. Fourth view, the party leader disagrees with saving the economy. Kennedy suggests Xi Jinping's focus is on developing domestic technology and controlling the global supply chain, prioritizing these goals over immediate economic interventions. This strategy includes advancing sectors like electric vehicles and solar panels. Despite evidence of overcapacity, she denies that Chinese high-tech products are flooding the global market. Many experts believe this focus on future technologies and extensive industrial policies is a strategic misstep, neglecting more pressing economic needs. This lack of decisive action has stirred significant public discontent, with criticism over the government's approach to market interventions and economic policies perceived as more beneficial to developers and local governments than to the general populace. Kennedy warned that these leadership shortcomings might precipitate an economic and political crisis, potentially leading to elite factional shifts or public protests against the CCP. He concludes that the increasing rifts within Chinese society and between its leadership could lead to more conflicts and less likelihood of bold, effective actions in the near future. Protests, wage strikes, and leaflet distribution rampant on the eve of June 4 across the mainland. As China's economic downturn continues, the populace faces mounting survival challenges, prompting a wave of grassroots resistance movements as the anniversary of June 4 approaches. On June 1, in Chaoyang District, Shantou, construction workers surrounded a police car to prevent the arrest of a fellow worker during a wage dispute. A video shows a worker, dressed in black, being detained in a police car while others held the car doors open in protest, eventually leading to the workers' release. On June 3, over a hundred sanitation workers in Gaomi, Shandong, gathered at the office of Mishi Street to demand their wages. Videos show a large group of workers in their uniforms blocking the office entrance, even stopping several vans and small trucks from leaving, visibly agitated. On June 2 and 3, Construction workers at the Xintian Di Chun Tianli project in Shuangliu District, Chengdu, Sichuan, demanded wages for two consecutive days, at times clashing with personnel employed by the developer. Videos depict a large number of police and security personnel on site, with netizens sarcastically commenting, there are more stability maintenance personnel than those demanding wages. In various areas, collective resistance movements by farmers have emerged. On June 3 in Rendong Village, Panyu District, Guangzhou, villagers blocked the village committee's gate to protest the local government's demolition actions taken without their consent. Videos show many villagers gathered under the rain with umbrellas, with police on guard. On June 3, villagers in Lulaiba Village, Leshan, Sichuan, blocked the gates of a construction site in Yanlanzu Tianlai, protesting the local government's development of land rented to villagers. Videos suggest a large crowd of villagers at the construction site's gate protesting the government's replacement of renting with requisitioning, with many individuals in white blocking the gate, possibly to prevent villagers from entering. On the evening of June 3, 
villagers in Pingjia Village, Zichuan District, Zibo, Shandong, surrounded their village committee to protest the local government's unauthorized use of 30 million yuan in land compensation funds to purchase financial products. Videos show the village committee's gate blocked by fences, with many police inside and villagers outside debating with officials who appear to be leaders. In Hubei, wrong citizens scattered leaflets from a high-rise building. On June 2, near the Helong Sports Center in Changsha, Hunan, someone scattered leaflets from a building. Videos show densely packed leaflets fluttering down like snowflakes from a high-rise, with many pedestrians looking up and picking up the leaflets to read. Recently, frequent incidents of public protests for rights protection have been reported across China, involving workers, farmers, civil servants, the financial investment sector, real estate, education, business, and various other fields. On May 22, Radio Free Asia cited a report by the international human rights organization Freedom House's China Descent Monitor, stating that from January to March 2024, 655 dissent incidents occurred in China, a 21% increase compared to the same period last year. The protesting groups were primarily laborers, 57%, followed by religious groups, 10%, homeowners and buyers, 9%, and others including farmers, students, parents, investors, consumers, activists, Tibetans, Mongolians, and LGBT plus members. Collisions with trains in Heilongjiang and Hunan result in seven deaths and three injuries. Recently, two separate incidents involving collisions and rear-end accidents with trains occurred in mainland China, resulting in seven deaths. On June 4, the official Weibo account of the Jiaomusi section in Heilongjiang reported that at 1.55 a.m., Freight train number 42109 was traveling on the downward section between Tang Yuan and Wang Jiang on the Suijia line when it collided with construction workers on the same track. At the scene, two people died and four were injured. The four injured individuals later succumbed to their injuries despite emergency efforts. On June 3, an accident was reported in Luaha City, Hunan Province, involving a car collision with a train. Red Star News reported that the incident occurred in the Yuanhui district of Luaha City. At 3 a.m. on the 3rd, a private car collided with a train, carrying four people inside. On June 4, the official report from Yuanhui district in Luaha City stated that a car carrying four people was driving to the intersection of the Luawu Railway when it rear-ended the last carriage of a freight train on the Luawu Line. The driver died despite attempts at resuscitation and the other three passengers were injured but not life-threatening. Asia's tallest waterfall faked? Water pipes discovered at the source on Yuntaishan. Yuntaishan waterfall in Hunan province is touted as the tallest waterfall in Asia. However, recently, a man climbed to the top of Yuntaishan waterfall in search of its source and was surprised to find several large water pipes. A viral video shows a male tourist climbing the mountain at the waterfall in Shouwu County. Jiaozuo City, Hunan Province, to find the origin of the waterfall, only to discover the source was several large pipes embedded in the rocks. The video reveals a pipe at the very top of the waterfall continuously spraying water. Claiming a drop of 314 meters, Yuntaishan Waterfall has been promoted by state media as the tallest in Asia. The admission fee to the scenic area is 120 yuan, about $16 with an additional 60 yuan, around $8, for a sightseeing car ticket. Netizens have expressed their dismay, questioning whether it is worth spending 180 yuan, about $24, just to see a few pipes. Online, many netizens have jokingly commented, at least do a better job and bury the pipes where they can't be easily spotted, you've left half of them exposed, so even the waterfall has its cheating moments. Regarding to the reason for installing pipes in the scenic area to create a waterfall, there are two explanations online. One explanation is that Yuntaishan Waterfall is a so-called seasonal waterfall, and it's the dry season in the north, and it hasn't rained this spring. The other explanation reveals that the use of water pipes might be permanent. Yuntaishan Waterfall was not always this way. It was indeed a natural source, spectacular and beautiful. The reason it now relies on pumps to form the waterfall is due to the waterfall's upstream location belongs to Shangxi Province, 
while the downstream scenic area belongs to Hunan province. The two provinces have not been able to reach a consensus on sharing the benefits of the scenic area. Shangxi built a reservoir that cut off the water flow at its location. As a result, Yuntaishan waterfall now relies on pumps to draw water upwards and uses pipes to achieve the desired effect. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths. Thank you.